Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Building on ICS Security Basics. What's next? Sponsored by Tripwire. My name is Carol Auth of SANS. Today's featured speakers are Kristen Polis, VP Industrial Cybersecurity, Belden Incorporated, Matthew Llewellyn, SANS Certified Instructor, and Joseph Blankenship, VP of Re VP Research Director, Security and Risk at Forrester. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to turn the webcast over to Tim Erlen, who will be moderating today's webcast. Thank you so much, Carol, for uh, the introduction and the introduction for our panelists. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, I have to say that, that being a moderator is a great job uh, because I get the chance to have a, an interesting conversation with um, a really a group of intelligent people on, on an interesting and, and um, uh, thought-provoking subject. So well, we've got a great group of panelists today. Uh, we're gonna get started right away. Um, and uh, uh, the place that I'd like to start with this group is actually um, at what I would uh, consider the beginning, if you will, for cybersecurity in many cases, and, and certainly for ICS cybersecurity. Uh, and that's with visibility. So visibility or the, the, the need to understand what's in your environment uh, is a, a hot topic these days. Um, and I think, uh, Joseph, if you wouldn't mind starting us off, giving us a perspective from, from your point of view on why visibility is such a, a popular topic in uh, industrial cybersecurity today. You know, I mean, th and thanks for that uh, introduction, Tom. You know, I, I don't know that it's just a popular topic just in ICS security. I think it's a popular topic in all of enterprise security, you know, quite honestly. Uh, a big part of the visibility question on the, you know, IT security, side as well as the ICS security side is uh, just understanding the environment and the assets attached to the environment. And it's, it's sort of going back to the, the idea of it's really difficult to secure uh, what, we don't, what we don't know about. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, has come to light in the last few years is we have a lot of you know, ICS assets or assets inside the, uh, the, the ICS environment uh, that are internet facing uh, and that uh, really you know, creates risk, you know, for other assets in the environment that are attached to the uh, to the network. And so I, I think that's the reason that visibility becomes so important. Let's understand what's in the environment. Uh, let's understand the vulnerable nature of the assets in the environment. And then now we can start, you know, designing a security strategy to secure those uh, those assets. And one of the, one of the, you know, the big questions is, you know, with, with this is, uh, if a asset is in a vulnerable state, is it an asset that's patchable, or do we have to find some other way, some other compensating control, perhaps, uh, to, you know, to protect that asset if we can't patch it? Uh, and that, and then visibility becomes critically important. It's also very important that we have good visibility to network traffic and who's talking uh, to assets on our network. I mean, if, we, if it's not uh, legitimate traffic, it's not somebody that we recognize as needing access uh, to that part of a uh, network then uh, we need to be able to shut that down. We can only shut those things down if we're able to see them. So you've you've taken a fairly broad perspective on, on what counts as, as visibility, ranging from um, simply understanding what assets are present to, to also understanding the, the risks that are in their environment. Um, I'm, I'm curious uh, if there are specific challenges in the industrial space with visibility that the IT counterparts uh, don't necessarily experience. And I, I think, Joseph, you might have an answer to that, but if, if any of the other two panelists wanna speak up on that topic as well, that, that's, uh, that would be valuable. I'll be happy to you know, just give you my two cents on it, and then uh, anybody else is more than welcome, obviously, to you know, jump in. Uh, as I kind of said at the top of this, I think it's a challenge on the uh, IT side as well as the OT side. Uh, the, uh, you know, what is uh, what traditionally has been a an issue is that the folks responsible for uh, security at a corporate level typically don't have a lot of knowledge of what the of the ICS environment, uh, the protocols used in that environment, and the types of assets involved. It, and it requires them to go and partner uh, with the uh, the people operating those assets in that network. 
uh, to understand. Uh, it also requires that we we have tools in place. And traditionally, until the last few years, you know, quite honestly, our tooling wasn't very good uh, for understanding uh, what's going on in an ICS environment. So it also requires we have tools uh, that understand the native protocols of an ICS environment and, uh, and kind of allow us to go observe those assets and categorize them. And, and Kristen, yeah. being on the, the vendor side, have you seen that evolution in, in the tools as well? Yeah, sure, absolutely. And I was gonna gonna piggyback off what Joseph had uh, had said um, because he makes a great point. Industrial devices are inherently a little bit different than what you see on the IT side, and and some of that uniqueness comes with the protocols, and some of that uniqueness comes with what the devices themselves are capable of. So when you talk about the challenges uh, of visibility in ICS environments, and maybe what differentiates them from the IT side uh, is how you're going to go about uh, understanding that visibility. Maybe more so on the IT side, you're used to using a lot of active methodologies where you can install an agent or you can actively query a device because it can handle it um, in order to get information about its configuration state and identify unique characteristics about it. Um, but because of uh, the nature of the assets in an industrial environment, you kind of have to have a differentiated approach to capturing um, that different data. So yes, there are some uh, assets in that environment that you can actively uh, speak with, but then uh, passive asset discovery is a, a really critical capability that, that you're gonna wanna look to employ for OT networks. So instead of uh, touching an endpoint, you're listening to the, the traffic on the network and you can glean a whole lot of rich information um, about your assets that way as well. Thank you, Kristen. So, um, and uh, Matthew, just to, to touch on, on your perspective a little bit here, I, I'm interested in what Joseph brought up around the the challenge being, you know, partly technology, but also partly the uh, separation or or, or uh, disjunction between IT and OT and, and responsibility for for ICS assets. Is that something that that you see as a from the SANS perspective uh, as well? Yeah, I mean the 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 challenge is is definitely multifaceted, as, as we all know. Um, I mean, number one, these are areas that a adversary would love to target uh, because of the notoriety, because of the public viewability, because of the potential even for extortion, you know, and showing a, a capability. So they'd love to be able to target it. So. So that said, they'll spend the time, you know, investing in research to try to find, you know, different types of vulnerabilities that they can then go and exploit uh, in ways to cause whatever condition they want to cause. Um, and so then as a defender, we have to take a step back and think about, you know, beyond just trying to get things to work in that break fix scenario that we're dealing with, or just trying to get things to work to make certain we make that quarterly uh, financial earnings report. And, and there's a lot of struggle, whether it's technology, whether it's budgeting. And again, those are the topics we're gonna be talking about just even on this uh, discussion now. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's there's so many different types of devices and technology that's been very purpose and intentionally built that you really have to be creative in how you're going to defend it, understand it, uh, after you've identified it to see how it should be used in your organization uh, normally to then identify the malicious activity that could be there. Hmm. So it feels a little bit like we, we start with visibility, um, but we're very quickly moving beyond that into, you know, now that I understand what devices are in the environment, what, what do I do with those, uh, with that information and, and what do I do to protect those devices? Um, and so my, my conclusion a little bit from this, this panel discussion is that while visibility is something we certainly see as a, a challenge in the market, uh, it's not something that um, we don't know how to address, uh, that, that there are tools uh, and processes in place that, that customers could acquire and use to gain that visibility in their industrial environments. Um, so if we move on to that next step, um, I think Kristen, maybe you'd like to take this one. What, what is that next step? Once you've got a view of the assets in your environment, what comes next uh, in the industrial environment? 
Yeah, there's, there's a lot of different things that you can do once you do have that visibility. Um, and, and I always, I go blue in the face, I say this all the time that, you know, um, it, it's not a project, it, it's a program. And so that um, individuals think about um, industrial cybersecurity, starting with visibility and moving on to something next is very important. So um, one of the things that I like to recommend talking about next is network architecture in, and segmentation. Um, because, you know, most ICS networks have been in place for years, and, and they only slowly change as operational requirements are going to change. Uh, and you don't see the same kind of turnover in equipment or structure that you might see on the IT side. And unfortunately, when these networks were built, uh, they were built based on kind of a flat model, meaning that um, communication from any host on the network could be routed to any other host on the network. And of course, today, we know that that would lead to serious concerns. If we had the opportunity to design a brand new network, we wouldn't do that. Uh, but even as early as uh, five years ago, um, OT security just wasn't seen as a significant risk. So they designed these flat networks. Um, so when you segment um, a network, after you've achieved visibility, you can start by grouping assets with common functions or purpose together, um, and, and of course separately from groups of dissimilar assets. And so it's all really about what the business purpose of those assets are. And with each of these different uh, zones of assets, you, you want to be able to control and monitor and protect those groups individually. Uh, one of the most basic examples of this is outlined in IEC 62443 where they say that you should segment uh, between control system networks and non-control system networks. Um, so, you know, segmentation isn't going to be a silver bullet. Um, it's that one of those next things you can do. If that rule simply would have been followed, um, some of the more recent pretty costly cyber attacks that have happened in OT environments uh, from WannaCry or NotPetya would have been prevented because those things actually started on the corporate network and came over to the OT network because there wasn't proper segmentation. And network segmentation is not something uh, new for the IT side. I mean, this is this is uh, you know old technology and old capability from from an IT security standpoint. But it seems like on the OT side, it's something that we're uh, you know, sort of relearning about if you if you came from an IT background. Um, at the same time, you, as you point out, uh, that doesn't mean that that when IT security has responsibility for the OT environment, that they are implementing network segmentation. It's it's almost as if they they've forgotten about that best practice because they've they've moved beyond it somehow. Yeah, yeah, and, and some of it just is a, um, an issue that stems from the, the original network design um, of them being, you know, flat to begin with. Um, so, I mean, you know, I think, so one of the more maybe robust segmentation strategies, um, once you get these zones, is to establish conduits between them. And, and what I like to tell people, because you're not going to be able to boil the ocean, and, you know, you're not going to be able to physically relocate assets is that identify the most critical set of assets in your environment, zone those off, and create a conduit between those assets and the outside network. And you can protect that conduit with something like a firewall. That simple practice of identifying those most that most critical grouping can go a, a very long way. Joseph, in your interaction with um, Forrester clients, do you, do you see them uh, looking at, at at network segmentation zones and conduits as a, a next step after visibility is that is that something that that um, clients are actually addressing these days well i think it's something that they they want to get to uh you, you know like, even on the it side i think we can all agree that a, a segmentation project uh you know can be really difficult right and one of the one of the issues that also comes up in ot environments uh, is that we have to be very, very careful that we don't introduce latency into the process. We have to be very, very careful that we don't uh, diminish availability because you kind of think about the CIA triad in an OT environment, we actually kind of pivot a little bit more toward uh, availability uh, and not you know, taking an asset offline uh, if we don't understand uh, you know, data flows and that type of thing. So it's certainly a place where we want to want to be. You know, one of the things that uh, we talk about a lot at Forrester is our zero trust model. And part of zero trust sort of says we're going to have this level of segmentation so we're not allowing unknown traffic uh, you know, to, to, to uh, be transmitted over the network you know, between these segments. And it's one of the reasons that uh, you know, 
we also kind of advocate for you know these you know, kind of you know secured zones uh, for you know, different types of OT assets. And do, have you found that customers are challenged with implementing a zero trust uh, approach around you know industrial protocols that that may not be well understood by some of the the IT security and IT networking devices that are on the market? Yeah, I, I think this is like a real area with a lot of the uh, folks that I talk to where they have to go where the IT security side, while they may have the corporate mandate to, to make sure the entire organization is secure, as soon as they you know, start working in you know the uh, the OT environment or the ICS environment, now it's it's time for them to go and partner with the people who are actually you know managing those devices and managing those networks. Uh, they're the authority on how the the, the assets work how the network uh, is structured, is architected, how, how data needs to flow, et cetera. Uh, and it's kind of an uncomfortable you know, thing many times because you know, if, I'm, if I'm responsible for a, uh, let's just say a, a plant environment and somebody from corporate security comes and says, hey, I'm going to you know, enforce all these security policies on you. The first thing I worry about is what are they going to break uh, as they come in here? So if we don't kind of do this in a collaborative fashion, and we're, we're probably not setting ourselves up for success. So a lot of the folks that I talk to, you know, and uh, we really hate making, giving advice at Forrester that starts with, hey, sit down and have a meeting. <laughs> but it's really more about, you know, get to know the folks that are responsible for the environment, work together <clears throat> on understanding the security needs and then design the security together. If you want to do a segmentation project like this, you can only do that uh, uh, in conjunction with the people who are actually operating that network. You know, you mentioned the the CIA triad: um, confidentiality, integrity, availability, and the the addition of um, of reliability to it. Uh, the other right. aspect I think that that often comes up in industrial. So reliability is a, is a key one, and and bridging that gap. Um, you know, having that meeting where you can bridge the gap between, uh, you know, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and and reliability being primary for for industrial environments, that makes a huge difference in in uh, you know fostering understanding uh, as well. I think the other aspect that shows up sometimes in, in industrial is often safety, um, and it depends on the industrial environment. But safety has a much bigger role in industrial than than in uh, in IT generally speaking. So um, w once we've once we've established sort of a you know a a network segmentation. If I'm if I'm following the the theme of the the, the discussion on on building on basics, I'll I'll assume that we've we've established our network architecture. You've now got an environment. You understand what's there. You've you've put up some basic uh, uh, segmentation. Uh, at this point, I think you know we have to talk about how do you defend and respond in that environment um, because it's it's going to be different than um, than an IT environment. Um, and so, I, Matthew, maybe maybe this is a good question for you to start with. What are the aspects of that ICS environment that make defense and response a, a different challenge than than in the IT environment? Well, I guess the first thing I'll say is there's physical risk, right? I mean, literally, phys something physically can happen uh, and throughout this process. But to connect a dot uh, to your question, just to a past thing we were just discussing there, I want to I want to connect something. Um, one, just on segmentation, some advice around that, just to make certain when you're setting up your defensive strategy, is how do you do that segmentation? And there's a lot of ways to think through it. Uh, you know, it can include questions around where the asset's physically located, right? Like that remote uh, uh, control point versus your control center. It can include who's administrating it. Again, now you have a coupling of those two things when you're using cloud-based assets. Uh, it could be the functionality, the criticality around it. You know, Can you do without this if you have to fall back on your operations? Can you segment back in some way that you can still operate even though, let's say, a cloud-based resource is not available or some remote resource, even local resource is not available. So knowing that you know you have an architecture that supports being able to fall back you know, on your footing if you think an adversary has taken over some kind of capability, either internally or because you've become aware of something through some other partner organization that's saying, hey, we've been compromised uh, because through some SEC filing that you found out, and now you're like, wow, do I have the proper backups? Do I have the proper segmentation? How do I want to fall back and operate with that new awareness that I have? So knowing those elements, now 
that visibility to help you make the decisions on how you want to operate while and before you're compromised or you may be compromised. And so hopefully you have that part of the game plan in place uh, beforehand uh, through some exercises so you can interpret the information that's coming from your segmentation devices. So does that concept of operating while compromised uh, connect to the zero trust model that, um, that Forrester promotes? I would say absolutely. Uh, I mean, you you basically are always trying to validate, you know, and, and the compromise doesn't have to be, you know, a human adversarial compromise. The compromise can even just be, you know, the fact that a device has suffered a mean time between failure. You know, you actually have a performance problem or a hardware fault that now you're in a response mode based upon your indicators and trying to identify whether it was uh, a threat actor or whether it was just the fact that there was an operational failure. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective because I, I think in the in the IT security world, we, we have often a, a, a strong, um, you know, split between operational issues and IT security issues. And, and there's, there's probably a whole bunch of history you could talk about there. But because uh, on, the, on the ICS side, on the OT side, because reliability uh, has such a, a primary, you know, position, um, we often start with there's, a, there's a, an issue, an incident, that's affecting our ability to deliver the service. And it could be any number of, of causes. Um, security is one of them. And I, I wonder if that brings together, um, you know, brings together a different kind of response approach than you see on the, on the IT side with, with OT. I think it does uh, because operationally, I mean, you're, you're at, you're operating this critical asset, right? That if if it's not there functioning, is going to have a dramatic impact on the business, or the operation, or whatever your mission is. And you're going to have a lot of indicators of information that you're trying to associate that's happening in this environment. And it is a gigantic difference, really, from I would say that traditional IT space, mm -hmm. uh, where you have just so much trust that you're trying to manage among these different types of elements of your control environment. It, it makes it sound like, like frankly, uh, OT and DevOps have a lot more in common than we might think. We tend to think of them as, as being at sort of opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, but, you know, this idea of combining operations and, uh, you know, security and, and development sort of uh, engineering, if you will, on the OT side, um, they're closer together than maybe we think at times. So um, one of the other topics that I think was sort of embedded in there that maybe we skipped through a little bit was this idea of of defense. Um, and Matthew, I think I think this is still a good one for you. Um, you talked a bit about response, but what about the the idea of defending those environments once you've you've sort of established your, you know, what that environment is and what what's in it? Well, if I go back to let's say visibility and just a great example of of not just the operational process that you have, but also looking at physical security and other elements and tying it back to some present day threats that we're hearing about, right? So we're hearing about just somebody finding some credentials um, in some way where they've been able to VPN access to your uh, corporate environment or your ICS environment and then gain access. I mean, that was the Ukrainian example, but we still hear it today, even this year, of lost credentials, of compromised VPN servers, of being able to gain access. And in a real easy win, uh, conceptually, but maybe not easy when logistically and technically to pull this off, is just having your data coming from your physical security system. So this is a quick view you can do in your own environments even today. Look at your physical security system and badging in, badging out the facility and somebody having access simultaneously into the VPN server. So if, if somebody is physically at the facility and you're getting records that says that somebody is accessing it, that's a quick win to be able to identify these different data sets. And what and what I see as our next step in Defenders is once you know, we have the visibility, we have our segmentation, we're starting to get our data flows and we're starting to correlate through data science, this type of visibility to see these things that stand out that we can then know potentially that somebody is trying to compromise. Maybe they're not in yet because they're failed attempts or maybe you already are compromised. And so it's that combination of view that'll help you then know 
all right, well, now what kind of access do they have and, and what decisions do we need to make using our uh, potential incident response plan that we have? Yeah, that sounds like a, a that correlation example sounds like a great use case for a you know a, um, a sim or a log management tool uh, that pulls in data from the physical access uh, control system. Very practical. So, in addition to those kinds of of, of uh, defense and response approaches, um, we also have you know with implemented network architecture and segmentation, we have an opportunity for. Uh, the implementation of more network-based access controls. Um, Kristen, do you want to talk a little bit about how network access controls can help in an industrial environment beyond just the segmentation? Yeah, sure. Um, and and you're right. I mean, and these these network access control tools might not get as much attention or, or the attention that they deserve uh, in an OT environment, but they're they're just as critical here as they are on the IT side. So, um, you know, at, at a basic level, um, network access control solutions they're called NACs. Um, they're going to help organizations implement policies for doing things like controlling devices and user access to their network. So user access is going to be really important here. Um, you can, with these NAC tools, you can set up policies for different resources or different roles or location-based access. Um, and we're used to interacting with NAC solutions in our daily lives, right? You go to a hotel or a public space and you have to log on to their guest network, and that's going to come with a certain set of privileges and a certain set of restrictions. Um, and so we can think about um, network access controls in the OT environment in a similar way. Um, so, so why is it important in an industrial context? Um, so as devices are going to connect to your industrial network, your NAC solution is going to see them, it's going to profile them, um, and then in real time going to be able to assess multiple variables about it, the, the identity of the device, who's using it, um, the security posture of that device, um, and you're going to be able to make decisions uh, on the fly because you're using an act tool on who gets access to the network, what kind of authorization they have to interact with different parts of your network. And um, you can have some pretty good enforcement policies um, as part of a NAC solution as well. Um, and so this is really important. I mean, to have the ability to do something like blocking or quarantine um, varying degrees of access. You, know, you want to be careful um, because you don't want to stop the industrial process, but at the same time, um, with the right set of um, you know access rules and credentials, you will have the ability to to better control um, who is able to actually be on your network and what they're able to to actually do. So it's an implementation of of uh, principle of least privilege as a as a network based control. Is that right? Right. Exactly. That makes sense. And uh, Joseph, on the on the the Forester side, when you when you're talking to to clients um, in the industrial space, do you see them bringing up NAC? Is it something that's that's on on clients' minds? You know, it, it, that's an interesting question. Tim. It, it, it really has not come up a lot for me. We think a, we probably think of uh, NAC a lot more with more of the IT network and uh, IoT types of devices. But you could easily extend that, as, as Kristen said, into the you know the OT or the industrial Internet of Things, if you will. I'm not really that fond of that term, but it's a it's a term that's that's out there, right? Um, anything that's attaching to the network, making sure that the policies are enforced, and you know that uh, the whole idea of uh, least privilege is sort of you know central to uh, to zero trust, right? Make sure we uh, you know only allow the access that's needed to perform a job or you know complete a task. Uh, as opposed to just playing wide open access. Mm -hmm. On the topic of IoT and IIoT, I, I, I once had a um, an OT engineer who who pointed out that uh, from his perspective, IoT is just cheap OT. Uh, that was sort of his perspective <laughs> on it, uh, which I always appreciated. Um, you know, industrial IoT I, I think has a good ring to it, and IoT is sort of the, the you know cheap version from the, the OT engineer standpoint. Um, I think I think uh, IoT and IIoT is a great example of where NAC might might really apply, and I actually think that topic area is is one where you see a crossover between um, IT and ICS in terms of cybersecurity, because you've got um, IT security organizations who are worried about IoT from a security standpoint, um, and you've got OT organizations that are worried about you know industrial IoT from a cybersecurity standpoint. And the line between those two can be blurry, um, you know, whether it, you know, which of the two categories it fits into. 
Um, and so it, it can be, I think, uh, and maybe maybe you've seen this. It can be a point where the two two groups can have a conversation that isn't maybe as uh, um, you know uh, difficult as you know how to secure e each other's respective environments directly. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in, okay. Tim, and say that, that's absolutely true. Sorry, Joseph. Um, and that's one of the best reasons um, for NAC implementation. A lot of these tools are designed to transcend um, and support IT, IoT, and OT so that the users can get um, a consolidated view um, from a visibility standpoint, but especially and most importantly from an access control standpoint. Sorry, Joseph. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, no, no, I was just going to say, Kristen, um, I think both parties could, could agree, right, that having unknown things attached to their network is a bad idea, right? And that's uh, really where NAC comes in to help, uh, is to keep the unknown devices off the network or devices that are not in compliance with policy off the network. So I completely agree with you. Makes sense. Makes sense. I'm going to take well, one second to, to remind everyone uh, who's listening that they can enter questions into the question window so that when we get to the Q&A period, there are some questions for us to, to answer there. Uh, Matthew, I think you were going to speak up there before I cut you off. Yeah, I know. It's, it's great. Um, just, uh, you know, and it's it's definitely resonating the discussions that we're having right now. I mean, the when you when you think about NAC, the, the, your first response by most people in the OT space are going to be like, no way uh, do you want to have that in place. But then they're thinking about operationally, again, this is me basically speaking, you know, if, if this is my facility, they're speaking about it from the standpoint of, you know, specific devices that are critical in their infrastructure. But then all of a sudden you start flipping it around, you start just ask the question, well, how much transits from let's say uh, a contractor system or laptop or transits, physical device transit from my traditional IT environment into my OT environment. And, and if you have that, you know, that laptop by the engineers or by the contractors or, or other devices, well then you, you spend all this time containerizing and segmentating and compartmentalization, but now again you just gone back to the sneaker net of, of devices. Or do you have wireless? You know that potentially could have other data points coming through it. So just be aware that there may be very specific areas of incredible value to have that type of emission control put in place, uh, and there may be other areas where it doesn't make sense to do immediately. Uh, I want to draw a line on that that comment back to the the where we started the conversation because you you brought up some really interesting examples of um, of connectivity of traffic of activity and to me those those seem to fall into the visibility bucket but when we talk about visibility we often talk about discovering assets um, is there an aspect of visibility that's actually about discovering activity as well There definitely should be. What, what I always try to encourage any of our students or participants, anybody that we have in our courses, as you go back out, think about two different contexts that you want to do your visibility and discovery. Think about operations mode and then think about maintenance mode. So operations, we're operating correctly, things are great, you know, whatever level. And then maintenance mode, maintenance mode may be where, again, something is just broken or maybe there's an interim update or some kind of adjustment, or maybe it's a larger scale maintenance mode because you're actually having construction. You really have to think about those two aspects. And then definitely when you think about assets, it has to include, right, the, the people, process, and technology. It has to include not just device assets. It has to include your supply chain, right? I mean, there's a whole category of things that you're getting into uh, when you're thinking about establishing your defensive posture. The the supply chain comment brings up, a, I think, one of the, the most challenging topics, um, not just for industrial, but in, in particular, we've seen examples uh, on the industrial side of um, as you have an increasingly connected supply chain, um, how do you ensure that the the members of that supply chain are adhering to appropriate policies for securing their environment and that a compromise on their side doesn't impact you? Um, uh, Kristen, have you given any any consideration to, to that supply chain side of, of um, industrial cybersecurity? Yeah, you know, it, it is increasingly important. And when we have 
uh, ever connected supply chains. I think it's, it's understanding the that your suppliers or that anybody within your supply chain is similarly interested um, is really critical. Uh, you're constantly sharing information. Um, so, um, you know, there could be some downstream impact on your organization as well. So, uh, if it's not something that um, an organization has thought about, I, I think it's a very worthwhile topic to, to discuss uh, with all the participants in their supply chain. And, and they can start at the beginning, just as we have today, um, with understanding whether or not uh, those participants have, have even implemented basic uh, visibility kinds of uh, platforms. Um, but it, as we are increasingly connected with our own organizations and with those within our supply chain, yeah, it, it's absolutely critical. And Joseph, do you have any, any specific advice for um, OT organizations or those responsible for an OT environment on um, assessing and securing the, the vendors in their supply chain? Well, yeah, I think a lot of the uh, when we start looking at uh, vendors in the supply chain, you know, one of the things that always comes up are those awful third-party risk questionnaires that uh, all suppliers get to fill out now. Yes. Uh, and, and those are great for compliance and saying, you know, hey, at one point in time, you actually had a secure environment. Uh, I think probably the, uh, you know, the 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 big thing I would uh, add to that is to make sure that that uh, that program is ongoing. And not uh, not the you know once a year fill out my really long spreadsheet of questions, or perhaps even uh, have tooling in place. But one of the uh, one of the things uh, pieces of research that we did last year was more not even so much about the the supply chain of materials and so forth, or maybe even third party vendors that may touch the network uh, that may come into play here. But Kristen kind of kind of hit on this a bit uh, is the data right the the integrity of the data and understanding where the data is coming from, how it's being sourced, who's got access to it, uh, that type of thing. Can it be manipulated in some way that could either cause harm to the environment or you know, cause harm, you know, perhaps perhaps operationally or financially. So it's also about you know data integrity. You know, how do how do your suppliers maintain the integrity of their data, especially if they're sharing the data with you to make either decisions upon or to operate upon? Yeah, that's an interesting point. And you, you can imagine pretty easily how in an industrial environment, um, manipulating data can have a, a you know a physical impact or, or change a physical outcome, whether it's you know temperature sensor data or some other kind of, of uh, uh, data that that impacts a you know the way a plant operates or a manufacturing floor operates. So that that sense of that idea of data integrity is is um, especially important there. So we've we've um, touched on a, a, a topic at a couple of points in here, but we haven't really dug into it yet. And I, I think it's it is in many ways one of the most important. So I, I want to sort of bring it up as our our final uh, major topic for the discussion, and that that's around who's responsible for securing ICS environments, and then how do you go about budgeting or obtaining budget for those kinds of projects. Um, and I think, um, uh, Kristen, I'll start with you because I, I don't think there's one answer to this question of who's responsible. But when you talk to customers, um, who do you see as, as generally having responsibility for securing the, the, the OT environments, the ICS environments uh, in those organizations? Yeah, it, we, might, we might all have a debate on this. So uh, I like this topic, Tim. Um, so, you know, it's actually what we're finding is it's a little bit of everyone. And it's a bit cliche, right, to say, oh, it's everyone's responsibility to make sure OT environments are safe. But what we found um, in interactions with a number of different organizations is that the ones that are truly the most successful, the most mature, and have made the most progress here are the ones that have established either things like joint task forces that have players from IT and OT on it, or maybe they've even um, created a new position within their organizations of someone who's kind of a, plays, plays both uh, ends of the ball uh, and works alongside the IT team and also works with the OT team. And that way you're gonna get the best practices and the best perspectives together. Uh, at the end of the day, there is zero substitute for the knowledge and the know-how that the individuals um, and the engineers on the platform have. Um, but there's also no way that you're going to replace 
some of that required IT know-how to create an effective security program. So what we're finding is that it, it's a little bit of everyone's responsibility in the most successful organizations. And again, they have those cross-functional teams or that designated person whose job it is to be cross-functional. So in the cases where they have that person, um, mostly because I, I, don't, I don't like the idea of teams being responsible for things, but in the case where they have that person, what, what do they look like? What, what does that role look like? What's the title? You know, how does, how would you, uh, how would you recognize that, that kind of a, uh, a role if uh, someone were describing it to you? I, I don't know that there is a single title that I've seen used for it. Um, it it's been um, titles that go along the lines of IoT security, industrial cybersecurity manager, uh, all sorts of different titles. How you recognize that person um, is that it's um, they, they typically come from one side or the other, IT or OT, and, and again, there's no hard and fast rule there, uh, but it's a personality, actually, that's extremely important for that kind of individual um, because a lot of the work that they do is bridge gaps, compromise, and share information and translate information uh, because the way that people on the plant floor communicate in more of an OT style language is completely different um, than folks are going to communicate on the IT side. And as we always talk about, the CIA triad slips itself um, when you go to the to the OT side. Um, and so this person in the middle is a translator and, and they have to have that as part of their personality to know that they're going to be the ones who are bridging gaps bringing these teams together towards a common goal. And Matthew, in your experience, have you, who do you see as being most often responsible for securing the OT environment? Well, um, it's a really good question. Here, here's, let me just put it two different ways on, on one thing that, that I would really encourage any company, any entity, any mission that you have that you make certain that this person, not necessarily as skills, but as organizationally has the authority to do things, right? So, so I think it's not necessarily where it's at or, or uh, who it is in the organization. It's more where it's at in the organization. And so when, uh, you know, when I've done any open source intelligence gathering on different companies um, or I'm asked, you know, go and look at, you know, X, Y, or Z, one of the first things I'll look at is an organizational chart. And I can pretty easily from that figure out whether there's going to be a successful cybersecurity program or an unsuccessful cybersecurity program just on the reporting strategy that's there. So, you know, what I commonly see is people that have accountability but not authority um, to be able to make the changes that need to happen. And I think that's the greatest struggle. Um, when it comes into budgeting overall, you know, it's, I really recommend as best you can try to get to be a part of an association of, of other in, you know, entities. Um, and we need to start lobbying for uh, some different tax incentives uh, around this specifically because there's not going to be really the big jump that needs to happen until there's more cost to doing nothing at all. Uh, so, you know, I, I think there's the combination there to summarize. Number one, it's make sure that you have the authority to make the changes on the organizational structure. Number two, try to be advocating as best you can, not just as an individual company, but as a consortium of companies to try to change, to have incentives to put in cybersecurity programs within your vertical. So when you say tax incentives, um, do you, I mean, I, I that tends to, to sound to me like a, a compliance initiative. Um, is that what you mean, that there need to be regulations that, that drive um, organizations towards industrial cybersecurity best practices? They can be different types of regulations, right? So, you know, my our, our company, uh, for the research that we do, uh, we use R&D tax credits to be able to help uh, do some of our cyber uh, security device and educational content development. Uh, maybe you could look into that as your own company. Maybe it's also the regulations like NERC SIP, again, which was phenomenal when that came out. Uh, and continues to be there as a cost of doing nothing. If you don't put in these controls, then you do know these penalties are coming, and so it encourage, encourages you to do right. But I, but I think you have to have both, right? You need to have the incentive program uh, as as well as the compliance and regulation program because of just 
how many things are happening right now within the cyber domain, right? How many attacks are occurring on an ongoing basis and the type of worldwide criticality we have right now. I feel that we need both. Now, so both the carrot and the stick. Yep, you got it. And Joseph, from your perspective, uh, who, who should be responsible for, uh, and I'll say who should be responsible and have the authority for securing these OT environments? Yeah, I've really enjoyed listening to uh, Matthew and Kristen's uh, perspectives on this because I, I I have the same difficulty trying to find the single person uh, with the responsibility. Uh, and when I say the single person with the responsibility, I mean the person on the ground that uh, that has the role and the budget authority. Because from what I've seen, it, it's the exact same thing. Where perhaps the CISO at the corporate level has the mandate. They have the mandate to go and set policy and and go and and request that other parts of the business get into compliance with that policy. And when I say request, I mean request, because they see so at the corporate level and most corporations uh, cannot walk in onto a plant floor and say, you will uh, adhere to this uh, uh, the security policy. You know, they, they don't have the budget for that plant. They don't ha necessarily have the authority to go and start uh, implementing controls in that plant. And so, you, you know, to Kristen's point, I think it's, it, very critical to have that task force type of mentality uh, to figure out who needs to be involved, who are the stakeholders, uh, and then establish budget and also establish risk uh, to figure out who uh, who's going to pay for it. Because the last thing a, a plant manager uh, or anyone responsible for infrastructure, the last thing that, that they on earth that they want is someone telling them they have to come spend money uh, that they don't get any uh, any credits back for. Uh, they don't. You know, no one really responds to that very well. So. I see that the CISO has the mandate, and then you know it's usually somebody lower down the uh, the food chain that sort of has the responsibility, but not necessarily the budgeting authority. Mm. As and, is, is oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, if I can make one more comment, just Please. not to not to be elusive. Uh, the ultimate authority, right? Definitely, I mean, and responsibility is going to be the level of your CEO. But who this is going to be delegated to should be somebody that's directly below that position. And and when we, you know, when I can use gathering techniques to pull up SEC disclosures that say, I mean, then this has happened, you know, this year where there's been plenty of disclosures saying, hey, we've been compromised and we're investigating it. And you have to do that, file that disclosure within a, a pretty short period of time. So, you know, and there's now a requirement if you're a publicly traded company, at least here in the U.S., traded on our exchanges, that you have to have somebody with cybersecurity awareness on your board of directors. And so it's at least now it's encouraging that it's at a much higher level. But if I want to be very candid, that ultimate authority should be a direct report the CEO, then the CEO makes, you know, any final decision that has to happen. Yeah, which which really just um, illustrates that when we're talking about cybersecurity, whether industrial or, or IT, that it, it is ultimately a, a business risk. And so it's relevant to the, you know, the the business and the CEO in that respect. Yeah, to so, support Matthew's point, I, I think he's absolutely right on. You know, it, it's it's just kind of odd, I think, that we don't see that happening more in, in practice. But that is, you know, I, I think that's absolutely the ideal, where this becomes a corporate mandate that is, you know, budgeted and supported you know, at the at the corporate level all the way down to the plant level. Yeah, excellent. All right. Uh, well, I want to thank you three for um, the really interesting conversation. We're going to move on to uh, the questions. There are a number of questions now uh, in the question window, so feel free to add more, and we'll see uh, how many of them we can we can get through. Um, I'll start at the top. Uh, this one actually is directed for, to Matthew specifically, um, although others can chime in, I think. Uh, can you speak to any recent attacks or trends on ICS with any examples? So um, anything that comes to mind on that question? Well, there's been plenty. There's been plenty in the news, right? Um, whether it's uh, well, how do I how do I summarize? Well, you know, if I want to summarize, it's going to be uh, as I had said earlier, as an example, just remote access links, specifically, let's say VPN credentials. Uh, but then there's also been more interesting things where the entity you know, they've leveraged that, right? And so, how have they leveraged it? Um, you know, without, you know, spoiling, you know, who potentially it could have been. Uh, can they go in and manipulate potentially 
some of the logic operating a, a critical capability of the facility, right? And so what if somebody could um, misoperate something to cause it to um, go off its axis? We'll just put it that way, right? So all of a sudden something that was balanced and, and performing well, now all of a sudden it gets misoperated in a way that it now is is unbalanced and unstabilized. And so if you use that example, you know, that, that goes back to the example, but just restated in a different way from 10 years ago of the Aurora vulnerability. Um, but now again, used in a different way for what I'm highlighting as the example. The offense is thinking about um, how to potentially misoperate things in ways that us as engineers don't want things operated, right? So, you know, they you, you don't want to have, you know, your oil tank go to zero. And so what they might do is they might go into your data set where you're pulling something via Modbus and literally go and change the values or change the logic or change the OPC server's database where all of a sudden that value is not correct. Uh, and it's just waiting for that opportunity uh, uh, for it to then break down at some point in the future or cause something to happen, depending upon if there's a release valve there to go with it. So, you know, I'm being very specific. Now, if we go back uh, to, you know, other events that have happened, not a lot goes to public uh, around that. Um, you know, there's been some discussions around some events in India. There's been some discussions around uh, some things within the uh, maritime sector. There's been some discussions around things in the mining sector. There's been discussions around and examples, and anybody can go and search for these things. But, uh, you know, ultimately, what is the adversary trying to do? One may be to try to misoperate it to cause a denial of service. Another one may just be something a lot simpler where they just want, they just want money. Right. They just want payments, you know, and so they're going to come back and say, you know, if you don't pay us, you know, so many Bitcoin because we've encrypted, you know, this much of your operator station or your logic or, or we're able to go and turn off certain points, then, uh, you know, unless you pay, uh, you know, it's it really depends. But I've heard of both of those scenarios uh, throughout this year. All right. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I've got a couple of questions around the same topic here, which is um, the. The intersection or, or lack thereof between NAC and uh, wireless. Um, so I'll, I'll try and ask a single question that covers both. Um, if it's true that that uh, much of the transit between IT and OT networks is around wireless, does NAC help in that scenario, or is there a, a better way to approach it? I can say that, yeah, NAC is going to be able to help you in that scenario, but there's a variety of different ways that you can approach it as well. Um, I think with, with NAC, you're, you're always going to be able to fall back on uh, the policies that you put in place. Um, so even with wireless, um, you're going to have the opportunity to uh, have the right level of privileges and access control between those networks. So uh, absolutely do recommend, uh, even with wireless, uh, using some kind of a NAC solution. All right. Thanks, Kristen. Well, and, and if I can make one more comment around that, if, if you think about the general concept of network emission control, and let's say you had some 900 megahertz field device, right, something that remotely you're pulling. Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be the, you know, a um, think about how you want to do network emission across that wide area connection. So you, you basically assume vulnerable assume manipulation, assume leak of data, and now you're gonna put in controls to restrict that network admission, that access. And so you have the traditional 802.11x, right? IEEE 802.11x style of network admission control, but you also have other ways just by putting in cryptography and and point-to-point -point, uh, protection links uh, with uh, RSA public and private keys for authentication. There's other ways you can also do that with network admission control. So think about that broad topic of how you want to do it, and then you can go and implement it technically. Great. Thanks, Matt. Uh, another question here. Um, what is the connection between ICS security and AI? Who's protecting who? Is it AI protecting ICS, or is it security protecting AI? I'm not sure who's best to answer that question, so feel free to jump in. 
Yeah, this is Joseph. I'll, I'll, I'll take a, a stab at that and would love to hear uh, <laughs> the other panelists. Uh, the connection between AI, um, I think the biggest connection is a, a a lot of hype about the capability of AI to secure anything at the at current state. Uh, we're talking about machine learning algorithms being able to examine network traffic and tell us what uh, is unusual, what is normal, what is uh, potentially bad. Uh, you know, that's certainly something that can be done and is you know, useful for behavioral modeling. Uh, I've seen a, some vendor claims that uh, that I feel are fairly unsubstantiated with the ability of current state AI to automatically secure environments. Uh, so I would not uh, put a great deal of faith in those claims uh, at the moment. Um, I would love to hear the uh, response from my uh, fellow panelists though. Anyone want to agree or, or, or better yet disagree with Joseph on that? <laughs> Feel free to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll just say, you know, even going back to early 2000s time frame, you know, there were uh, artificial intelligence systems that were operating some of our power plants, right? And, and other, you know, oil and gas, right? We had some, not gas, but some of the oil side, where we had some intelligent decision making and even some automated control back then. You know, and so we fast forward to today, where now we're starting to think about where now just out of the control side, can we use it for better predictive understanding and analytics around cybersecurity? You know, um, you know, I, I think personal response, sometimes we make things too complex uh, just to try to seek another answer when the answer is right in front of us. Um, oh. I'll remind everybody of your example of the VPN connection uh, and the, the person who's in the building. Uh, there you go, right? And so, <laughs> and so there's what I've felt now for a number of years is that we have a lot of great technology already and capabilities to secure assets. It's just that we still don't have the incentive to go do it or the legal requirements to do it. And so that's going to be my general answer. All right. You know, it, it, and to kind of further your you know, go back to the original point of the uh, the question too, Tim. You asked about uh, was it about protecting the AI, and I think Matthew just you know made a, uh, a statement that you know, kind of makes you draw a circle around that, right? Uh, because you're you are doing using AI or at least machine learning or or what have you, data science, uh, to make some of these automated decisions on what may be happening in the plant or predictive capability. That kind of goes right back to that whole question of data integrity. What kind of da data is, where is the data coming from that are feeding those systems? And if, can it be tampered with in such a way that the system makes a bad decision? Uh, so it actually does become uh, very important that we protect those systems uh, so they don't make bad decisions uh, automatically. Excellent, thanks. Uh, okay, so I'm going to take uh, one last question for the, the group here, uh, and I'm, I'm going to rephrase it a little bit. Um, do you, what do you, do you see industrial organizations adopting cloud? And if so, what are the implications for those ICS environments? I'll start just um, from the from the vendor perspective of saying that the adoption I wouldn't say has quite happened yet. Um, but there's a lot of curiosity around it um, because they see their counterparts in IT. Um, cloud, of course, is a, is a huge topic. And so the questions that I think we need to be prepared to answer is, you know, what are the benefits? Um, how can you ensure that things are continually secure? How can you continue to assure that uh, your plan operation is going to be, uh, that's going to run uh, completely productively? Um, so uh, I think there's a, there's still a leap that we need to make, um, but that some of the, the, the great uh, opportunities that came about because of cloud computing technologies in the IT space can be leveraged uh, in OT, uh, but there's still just a lot of curiosity around the topic uh, versus actual implementation of it. If I can make a couple comments on this, and then an example that I'm happy is outside of the sector right now, but uh, so 
one, if you if you go down the path of cloud, be thinking about your compartmentalization solution, your trust that you're taking on with that, and then contractually make certain you have a couple things in place, right? So number one, think about how you can get out of it uh, if you need to in the future to roll back, to take it back internally. And then number two, what if the network goes away where you're not able to access that cloud solution? And is there a way contractually that you can make certain and technically to make certain to have a backup solution at your facility that you could still gain access to and that you're in control of the priority around responding to that, right? I remember, you know, now a couple examples. Number one example, right? Uh, I think it was Hurricane Katrina. It hit down in the um, south eastern US and everybody had backups, but they had outsourced their backup solution, basically like cloud-based backups, but they were physical backups at that point. But who got access to them first? And it was really a struggle who was able to get that restored in any priority because that company has their own prioritization of how they were trying to respond to you. Number two, as an example, again, not in um, OT at all, thank goodness, but uh, it was met, met patient records and you had about 400 dentist office uh, over the summer that all of a sudden the third party that they had contracted their patient data with was ransomware. And so then all of a sudden all these uh, entities could not uh, handle any of their uh, patients. Uh, now you could also wonder, okay, who copied that data or what could happen with it? Uh, but that trust was then taken advantage of. And again, I'm just happy that, uh, you know, it wasn't the dentist's medical equipment that was directly online that was ransomware or again, in this case, the OT space. But it just gives an example of what can happen. All right. Uh, thank you. And with that, we are at the end of the hour and out of time. So uh, once again, thank you to all of the panelists, Kristen, Matthew, Joseph, for a great discussion. And thanks to everyone who attended. Uh, for spending a little time with us. I hope it was interesting and enlightening. All right, well, I'll, say, I'll repeat it. Thank you so much, Tim, Christina, Matthew, and Joseph for your great presentation. And to Tripwire for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sands.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.